All right, let's try this again. <laughs> we just sang a song about power, power and the blood of Jesus. And power is such an interesting topic these days. Uh, as always, it seems to be in short supply. At least that's the assumption I get as I watch our world try to rake in more and more power, establish more and more control over themselves and others. Power and control dynamics are notable in the haves and the have-nots as well. Those without power and control uh, seem defeated and removed. Those with power and control seem to do everything they can to retain that power, even drumming up, to f drumming up fear as to what would happen if we would lose this power. That's the tough part of our culture to juggle when we come up to pieces of scripture like our passage today. Scriptures that talk about laying down your life, loving others as yourself. The first should be last. And many other countercultural passages that point to Christ's humility and our call to follow Christ's example. Lent is journeying towards the cross, remembering our own mortality, when reflecting on Jesus' sacrifice and the days that come before that sacrifice. Jesus told his disciples about the prophecies, about his coming death and resurrection. And in our passage today, Jesus talks about his life once again, and how Jesus' life is an example of God's love for us. Before getting any further, let's look at our passage of Scripture today. And if you are able, please stand in the honor of the reading of God's Word. This is John chapter 10, verses 14 through 18. I am the Good Shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and thou shalt be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life, only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. You may be seated. The New Testament isn't the only place we see shepherds and sheep referenced. Psalm 28 uh, contains some of the most famous words of Scripture. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The image of God as shepherd permeates the Hebrew scriptures. The children of Israel are referred to as sheep, prone to wandering and in need of guidance, leading, and care. The imagery extends to the heroes of faith as well. Moses and King David are both literal, literal shepherds before they are leaders of Israel. So when we arrive at our passage today, when we get to this passage that we're reading in John 10, where Jesus calls himself the Good Shepherd, we bring all the context from previous references from the Hebrew Scriptures as well. Jesus is not simply making a shallow point here about his care and compassion. He's making a prophetic declaration that he is, in fact, Messiah but not the Messiah God's people were expecting. You know, you'll often hear this story or that comparison during Christmas time, Jesus arriving as a baby instead of a mighty warrior. Instead of coming with strength and power to fight a bloody revolution for the liberation of God's people, Jesus comes like a shepherd who is willing to lay down his life for his sheep. He is once again working in ways they don't expect for a kingdom to look like, different from the one that they think they want. 
John chapter 10, where our verse is located today, is a critique of the authority's actions in chapter 9, just before this one, where the Pharisees held a trial for a blind man that Jesus had healed. And they ended up throwing him out of the room that they were in, kicking him out. So it makes sense that the next chapter that would have a focus or a critique on authority, on power and control. The theme of transformation in this passage is strong. We are brought into the fold, made new, transformed by Jesus, brought into Jesus' flock. When Jesus says, I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold, I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice, so there will be one flock, one shepherd. He is talking about us, about others in our community, because we were all at one time lost and now found. We all lived according to our own terms, and we are now transformed and live life according to our shepherd, our one shepherd, Jesus. In verses 14 through 15, Jesus uses the word know. Jesus knows his sheep. The Father knows Jesus. The word know here is more than just knowledge. It's more than just knowing. Jesus is talking about a loving and loyal relationship between sheep and shepherd, between himself and his followers, and between God and himself. And then continuing into verse 16, as the good shepherd, Jesus would not only prevent the scattering of his sheep, but also bring other sheep into the pen, the safety of the pen, bringing more into the flock, coming together into one big flock with one shepherd, all listening to the shepherd, all responding to the voice of the shepherd. Jesus said, I must bring these other sheep, these different sheep, these sheep that didn't look like you or don't sound like you, into the flock. And we will be united and reunited with God the Father. We are transformed and included into Jesus' flock. Verse 17 can be a little tricky, though. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. At face value, it seems that Jesus is saying that God's love is transactional, that God only loves Jesus because Jesus is going to do something for God. Jesus isn't saying that God only loves him because of his sacrifice, but that God's love is revealed through Jesus' sacrifice. Also revealed through Jesus' love for Jesus' flock. We see God's love in Jesus' love for us. And how can we talk about the book of John with also not talking about the most famous verse in all of Scripture, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Jesus, in all of Scripture, points to God's love for us. God's love is demonstrated through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And finally, on to verse 18. No one takes it from me, but I lay, down, lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I receive from my Father. Jesus was faithfully obedient to all that the Father called him to, acting under his own control and authority. Jesus speaks for himself as an agent of both his death and his resurrection. This indicates the unity of the Son and the Father. It also shows that he is one who is a, whose life, and uh, he risks his life, to bring life and salvation to the sheep, to us. Where the Pharisees earlier in the book of John pushed out anyone who didn't sound like them, Jesus pursues all. 
Jesus doesn't just include all, but pursues all. Jesus tells us that he has people to go after, to bring into one unified sheep pen. Where Pharisees, the religious leaders, the people of power and control at the time, would do anything to keep that power, Jesus lays down his power and even his life in order to bring even more people into the fold. As mentioned before, the Old Testament is full of sheep and shepherd references. Ezekiel 34 is another example of that. Uh, Another example of where God is described as shepherd of the Israelite sheep. This passage references an era often called the Day of the Lord, a time when predators will no longer attack the sheep, uh, the Israelites, and they would be safe. The idea of the Messiah as a shepherd would be familiar to those in the Jewish faith. So in verses 1 through 4 of Ezekiel 34, shepherds are concerned with power and resources they can gain because of their position rather than caring for God's people. God's people, the sheep, were scattered and left as food for the animals in the area. Just like the leaders cast a man, a healed man by God in chapter uh, 9 out, instead of shepherding their newly converted child of God. In verses 5 through 6, the shepherds did not search for them, the sheep that they abandoned, because they did not care. Again, reference that against chapter 9, the Pharisees kicking out this newly healed man. In verses 10 through 11, God declared that he would remove the shepherds and rescue the flock himself. God would bring the sheep back from exile, where they had been scattered, foreshadowing the restoration of all of humanity. And thinking of biblical heroes, King David, you may remember, was a shepherd as a young boy in a family of shepherds. As a king, he, also descri- he was also described as a shepherd of Israelite people, which is why it makes sense for Jesus, who is in David's family line, to claim this identity as well. Because vocations were family-based, family business, Children engaged in the same professions as their fathers. The lineage of King David is connected with shepherding. And multiple Old Testament scriptures, including many Psalms, describe God as the ultimate good shepherd who cares for his sheep. And we see Jesus' connection to God and a revelation of the Trinity as Jesus claims to be the good shepherd. When Jesus claims to be the good shepherd, he is blatantly identifying himself as the Messiah. The Pharisees, as you know, know their scripture well. And they immediately recognize Jesus' reference to Ezekiel right away. And of course, they're not thrilled by his claim of Messiahship. Jesus equates his presence and demonstrated in the ways that he acts compassionately towards the poor, oppressed, and marginalized, both the Jews and Roman society, bringing more and more people of all different backgrounds into one sheep pen, to one flock. Some thoughts on sheep. You may know better than I do, so correct me if I'm wrong. I understand from many stories of the Bible, and I guess cultural references, that sheep tend to wander. Yes or no? Okay. (laughs) Psalm 23 references still water because sheep have been known to drink water with strong currents. Do they do that? I don't know. Someone tell me. Are sheep drinking at a raging current? We'll see. (laughs) And then they are swept away and drowned. Sheep can get themselves trapped in hard-to-reach places, areas where there are no food sources nearby. Agree? 
I've seen some crazy videos of sheep being dragged out of like really tiny holes. And there's like never any context. So I just see a guy with his hand down there. And I'm like, what is going on? And then finally a sheep appears. Anyway, so I've seen some of that going on. Um, I hope you understand where I'm going with this and how hard it is to be related to what's happening in these scriptures. <laughs> sheep are vulnerable to predators. They don't have claws, sharp teeth, or a way to camouflage themselves. So shepherds are the primary way to keep them safe. Shepherding was not a highly favored job in the time of Jesus. The hours were long, not just during the day, but also because shepherds had to sleep with their flocks overnight to protect them from nocturnal predators, which honestly, they sound way worse anyway. So they got to stay. Shepherds were criticized for being away from their families too much, leaving them vulnerable. Shepherds were often in danger themselves due to bad weather, predators, or thieves, or having to walk very far to graze the flock. Um, interesting fact I didn't know. Shepherds each had a unique call for their sheep. Different flocks of sheep often grazed in the same patch of grass. Uh, so when it was time to go, the shepherds relied on their sheep to listen, to recognize their voice as well as their call, so that the flocks could be separated once again. The sheep would not follow unless they heard the call of the voice that they knew. And this is why Jesus emphasizes that his sheep know him. He has a unique call, a unique call to salvation, freedom, and inclusion in the kingdom of God. But he also has a unique voice, gentle, loving, and compassionate. If Christ acts in the character of God and loves his sheep, then God's people can be confident that those acting in ways counter to love and compassion are not acting on the behalf of the shepherd. When we see people claiming that they care for sheep, but are acting in ways that are counter to the ways of the shepherd, we know that they are thieves and predators. And Jesus lays down his life for his sheep. Jesus' love and compassion for his sheep go so far that the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. In Psalm 23, the shepherd is described as walking with the sheep through the valley of the shadow of death. In the parable of the lost sheep, Jesus declares that one lost sheep is more important to the shepherd than the 99 who are not lost. Again, Jesus goes and pursues all to bring them into one united sheep. In Jewish religious practice, sheep were often used as sacrifices an offering a ritual meant to bestow forgiveness. And so, in a role reversal, Jesus says that he, as the shepherd, is willing to take on the role of the sacrificed lamb in order to save the sheep. And Jesus is often referenced as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What does it mean for him to be a good shepherd who, instead of having his life taken from him, willingly lays down his life for the sheep? Love, compassion, and incarnation are at the heart of Jesus' message. God leaves power and might behind in order to unite with humanity in our fullness. Love, compassion, and incarnation are at the heart of of Jesus' message. God leaves power and might behind in order to unite with humanity in our humanness. The kingdom of God is not about amassing power and control through violence, but about gentle, loving kindness that sacrifices for others. Even though today we still often look for or prefer the violence and power and control, we are called to follow in Jesus' footsteps. 
if the way of the good shepherd is through the gate of compassion, of love, sacrifice, laying down power, then anything that doesn't embody those things is not of the good shepherd. If we are doing anything or living outside of compassion, love, sacrifice, laying down power, then we need to repent and again live as our shepherd had lived. The safety and well-being of God's sheep matter to God. We often think that this passage is just a great spiritual word, which it is, but there is real physical care and pride in caring for these sheep, which are fed, loved, and protected. We are embodied spirits, so we fully matter, body and spirit too. We matter to the Good Shepherd. As sheep who follow the voice of Christ, we should recognize and care about those who are being persecuted or torn apart by others. The kingdom of God operates differently than the kingdom of the world. Where the world says to amass wealth and power and control, the kingdom of God says lay those things down and follow Jesus to the cross. If we follow the voice of the Good Shepherd, what is that voice calling us to do? If we follow the voice of the Good Shepherd, what is that voice calling you to do? Christ might be calling us in the season of Lent away from habits, places, or things that keep us separated from God. We are called toward a life abundant, abundant in grace and mercy and love. We are also called to embody the self-giving love of Christ, who willingly laid down his life for his sheep. Where, Where can we lay down our lives for those around us? Following Christ's example. Sometimes this call has been literal, For the people of God. Many faithful Christ followers have lost their earthly lives as a result of following Jesus. Other times we are called to give up certain powers or privileges out of love for others. When we embody Christ's sacrificial laying down of his life, we join in the glory of the resurrection, the transformation into new life with Christ. When we embody Christ's sacrifice in the world, others experience the resurrection power of Christ too, which can change, transform communities, which is what we're interested in doing here, not just in this room, but in our entire community, bringing that transforming love of Jesus to Wenatchee. Following in Jesus' footsteps, Not being content with our own pen right now, but again, like Jesus, pursuing others who also will hear and know the voice of our shepherd, the true shepherd, Jesus. Lent is a season of sacrifice. Sometimes we lay down things in order to pick others up. We lay down things of the world in order to connect with God in more life-giving ways. We see this image of Jesus as the Good Shepherd, a God who gave up everything in order to love in us as well. So we respond to the voice of the Good Shepherd by doing likewise, laying aside our power, our privilege, our control, and sometimes our lives in order to follow him. We embrace others in love and ultimately see the power of the resurrection permeate the world, starting with our community. We join in in Jesus' call. We as sheep point to other lost sheep that Jesus is our shepherd. Listen to his voice. 
as Jesus invites them and forms one unified sheep pen. Reunited and loving God, the God that loves us. Our church has traditionally participated in communion on the first Sunday of the month. And we will participate in that tradition today. In our staff meeting earlier this week, uh, we paused to think about the decision to participate in communion this Sunday, or in the season of Lent at all. As we're looking towards the cross and not yet reflecting on Jesus' death. Communion and the story that helps us participate in communion do point us to the cross. On the night of the story, from where we get our communion instructions, Jesus was looking towards the cross, and his death was very near. That story is a piece of Jesus' journey towards the cross, the journey that we are reflecting on during this season. And so as we participate in that journey, reflect on that journey, we're going to participate in communion together as well. And remember Jesus' sacrifice for us. We gather together to grow in our faith, our faith in our shepherd who laid down his life for his sheep. Pastors, would you please come and help prepare? And as they come and prepare... Some instructions. We ask that when you are ready, please exit your row uh, to your left. Come down and receive the bread and juice, and return to your row on the right side of the row uh, with the elements held. Please feel free to pause and pray at your seat or your altar or the altars, um, and please hold on to the bread and juice. And I will read that story that I was just referencing, and we will participate together. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this opportunity to hear your word. Thank you, Lord, that you love us so much that you sent your Son. That Jesus is a focal point of your love that we see your love through Jesus. May we cling to that love. May you help us be compassionate and full of love this week, Lord. Please be with us as we gather at your table. Amen.
Jesus and the disciples were gathered together celebrating the Passover with a traditional meal. And while they're eating, Jesus took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body. And we do the same. Then he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is the blood of my covenant that is poured out for the many for the forgiveness of sins. And we do the same. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your sacrifice. Thank you so much for this reminder that we participate in communion as a reminder of your sacrifice. Lord, as we continue in this journey of this Lenten season of journeying with you towards the cross, may you continue to remind us to, to follow you as our shepherd. Continue to be with us during our week, Lord. Amen. Would you please stand for this benediction? May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.